come to school in the year. We shall be looking at English studies and the topic for today is Concord. I am Oluwabumi Fakoya. Remember last week we uh, discussed Concord and uh, I told you that even the word of God confirms Concord. Can two work together except they agree? But also have family just like you and I also have our home family too and we work together in unity and i also told you at our last class that concord is the agreement between the subject and the verb in a sentence and of course i told you that subject could be a noun a pronoun or a noun phrase we also discussed some of the rules of concord we discussed, remember room number one that we discussed, a singular subject takes a singular verb. The rule number two, a plural subject takes a plural verb. And rule number three, nouns that are plural in form but singular in meaning take singular verbs. Today, we will also look at some other rules governing concord. And at the end of today's lesson, you should be able to explain Concord, identify some of the rules of Concord and apply the rules you have learned correctly. The first rule, which happens to be rule number four that we want to look at today, is two or more singular nouns connected by hand take a plural verb. Two or more singular nouns connected by hand take a plural verb. Let's take, for example, David and Jonathan are friends. If you look at this sentence, we have David and we also have Jonathan. Because we have David, which is a noun, and we also have Jonathan connected by hand, it is necessary for us to use ha. We cannot use singular verb because we have plural subject here. David as one entity, one person, and Jonathan, one person too, making two people. That is why it is necessary for us to use the plural verb, which is ha. And this sentence is meaningful because we have used the right, we have used the right uh, subject, we have also used the right verb. Let's look at another example, which is the lady and her daughter were here. The lady and her daughter were here. Now, look, looking at this sentence structure, you will say that we have the lady, we have our daughter. We have our daughter, and that's why we have used were to make it a complete and a correct sentence. Now, if we use was, it's with the sentence will not be correct because we have plural subjects. And because we have, we have plural subjects here, the, the correct thing to use will be where, which is the plural verb. I think it would also be good that we look at another example there. Example three, now, you and I have tried our best. If you look at this sentence structure, you will see that we have you, which is a pronoun, and we also have hi, which is also pronoun, used with have, because we have a plural subject. We have you, which is one pronoun, and hi, which is another pronoun, making it, making it a singular subject, and that's why we have used have. It will not make meaning, it will not be meaningful, the sentence will not be meaningful if we use as we have used you, we have used I, and we have connected it to with and, and that's why we have a plural verb there. I hope you have understood this rule perfectly. Let's move to rule number five. Two or more singular nouns connected by hand, expressing one idea, take a singular verb. Take a singular verb. Note two or more singular nouns connected by hand, expressing one idea. 
take a singular verb. Now, can you construct an example on that? Well, okay, let me give you my own example. We have bread and butter is my favorite food. If you look at this sentence structure, you see that we have bread in the subject's position and we also have butter. Because we have, for the mere fact that we have bread and butter in the subject's position, that does not mean that we now use a plural verb. No, because bread and butter have been used as one entity. You, can, you cannot take butter in isolation of bread. You hit the two together. And that's why we refer to it as singular subject. And that's why it requires a singular verb. You cannot say bread and butter are my favorite food. No. And of course, you know that there are also similar Several similar examples on that. We have uh, rice and beans is my favorite food too. So you cannot say rice and beans are my favorite food. So let's look at another example. Knowledge and wisdom makes a man great. We look at this sentence structure. We have knowledge and we have wisdom. The two has been used together and of course, they are in the subject position. For the mere fact that we have knowledge and uh, wisdom, that does not make it a uh, plural, plural subject. So they are referred to as one entity. And that's why we have used a singular verb. So I believe you can also construct your own sentence at home too. But before I leave this rule. Let me give you another example. We have Romeo and Juliet is an interesting movie. For the mere fact that we have Romeo and we also have Juliet, uh, that does not mean that, oh, that should be plural subjects. No. Romeo and Juliet is a title of a movie and it's referred to as one entity. It is singular and that's why it must take a singular verb. Remember? Titles of books, titles of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, movies, we can use singular verb when we are using uh, these titles to construct sentences. I'm sure you can also look for more examples to practice, uh, to practice this rule. Now, let's move, at, let's look, quickly look at another rule, which is now Rule number six, when a compound subject is joined by either or, neither nor, the verb agrees with the subject closer to it. You have to take note of this when you are constructing a sentence or when you are constructing sentences with either or, neither nor, the verb must agree with the subject closer to it. So remember this rule is when a compound subject is joined by either or, neither nor, the verb agrees with the subject closer to it. Let's take for example, either John or his friends are responsible for the damage. If you look at this sentence structure, you will see that we have John and we also have his friends. So when you are constructing a sentence or when you are speaking, you look at the last subject before you can use your verb. That is, the last subject will determine the kind of verb that you will use. Looking at this structure now, you, you know, we have John and we also have his friends. If you look at this, you discover that his friends is closer to the verb and that's what has dictated this verb, which is plural verb because we have his friends. We don't reckon with John. His friends is closer to the verb, and that's why we have used plural, plural verb. Either John or his friends are responsible for the damage. So let's look at another example. Neither the student nor the teacher is in the classroom. If you look at this sentence, you'll see that we have neither the student nor the teacher. And 
the subject closer to the verb is singular. We have teacher, one teacher. And because we have one teacher here, we must use singular verb, which is is. And that's why we have used is here. We cannot use are because we don't have students here having teacher there. We don't have students here. We have teacher, one teacher. And that's why we have used is, singular verb. I think it will be also good for us to take one more example on that for clarity. Neither Ruth nor Gabriel has taken the book. If you look at this sentence structure, you will see that we have Ruth, one person, and we also have Gabriel. But because we have a singular subject closer to the verb, that is why we have used has. We cannot use have because we don't have two people here. We only have one person, which is Gabriel. And that's why we have used a singular verb. So try more examples at home and applying, try more examples at home, applying this particular rule to construct more sentences on this. We now look at the last rule for today, which is, when words like nothing, everyone, anyone, anybody, nothing, somebody, and so on and so forth, are used as subjects, we use singular verbs. Take note, when words like nothing, everyone, anyone, anybody, nothing, and so on, are used as subjects, we use singular verbs. Take for example, everyone knows the doctor. Everyone knows the doctor. Everyone here is singular. And that's why we have used knows. For the mere fact that we use everyone. Everyone is not being specific. So that is why it must take a singular verb. Also, we have Nothing is impossible with God. If you look at this sentence structure, we have nothing is impossible with God. Now, nothing is not specific to, it's not very specific. Nothing, not specific. And that's why we have used a singular verb. Take another example again. Somebody is waiting for me outside. Somebody is waiting for me outside. Somebody is not being specific. Somebody, you know, we can mention anybody as somebody. So it's not specific. And that's why we have used singular verb. Because somebody is not being specific. We have, like I told you earlier on, we have several examples under this. We have nothing, anybody, somebody, uh, everyone and so on and so forth. You can use all these words to also construct more sentences at home. I'm sure by now, you should be able to explain concord. You should be able to identify some of the rules of concord, and of course, apply the rules learned correctly. And remember, I also told you that the word of God confirms concord. Can two work together? except they agree just like you and i have our own families too and of course we work together in unity god wants us to god wants us to work together in unity against our next lesson i want you to take down this assignment write three sentences on each rule discussed today remember we treated four rules and I want you to construct three sentences each on the rules discussed today. Till we meet next time, stay safe.
Good day, viewers. This is CRSM virtual class. My name is Anema Adiasan. I teach biology. Today, we are going to discuss a very familiar topic, which is fruit. Say it after me, fruit. But at the end of this class, you will be able to define the term fruit. Also, you'll be able to describe the structure of a typical fruit, like man mango, coconut, and so on. And then, finally, you'll be able to classify fruit into two types. Now, a fruit is defined as a structure that develops from the fertilized ovary of a flower. Let's take that again. A fruit is defined as a structure that develops from the fertilized ovary of a flower. Every plant that has a flower has the ability to produce fruit. Now, before we understand how fruits are formed, we want to cast our mind back to the process of pollination and fertilization. To be able to do that, we want to consider the structure of a simple flower. So we have the male part of the flower, which is made up of the filament and the anther. We have the beautiful petals. We have the filament. We have the anther, the ovary. And within the ovary, we have the ovules. We have the receptacle and the stalk. Now these are part of the flower. We have the style, the stigma, and the style. So this is a simple structure of a flower. Now, remember we are defined pollination as a movement of pollen grains from the anther of a flower to the stigma of a flower. When that happens, the anther contains the male gamete called the pollen grains. So when they fall on the stigma of the flower, they will move down the style till they get to the ovary. The ovary contains the ovules, which are the female gametes of a flower. When once the pollen grain come in contact with the ovo, a process called fertilization occurs. So fertilization is defined as the fusion of the anther, which is the male garment, of the pollen grains, which is the male garment, with the ovo, which is the female garment. That will lead to the formation of a zygote. When once that happens in any flower, all the other parts of the flower will wilt away, become dead, and fall off. So if you pass by that plant, maybe it's an okra plant or a tomato plant, it will look as if there are no flowers again. Because of the process of fertilization, the other floral parts will wilt and fall off the stalk. And so what will be remaining at that stage is only the fertilized ovary. So as nutrients is added to the plant, being absorbed from the soil, water and mineral salts added to the plant, the fertilized ovary will increase in size and become a fruit like this, grow to become a fruit. And then the fertilized ovu that were inside the ovary before fertilization will now become the seed inside the fruit. So this is how a fruit is formed from the fertilization of the ovary of a flower. That is why I said initially that every plant that has a flower has the ability to produce fruit. So that is the way fruits are formed. Now that takes us to the structure of a fruit. Now when you consider a typical fruit like coconut or apple or mango fruit like the one I have here, we discover that a fruit is made up of a fruit wall which encloses one or more seeds. A fruit is made up of a fruit wall or pericarp. Another name for the fruit wall is pericarp. And this fruit wall encloses one or more seeds depending on the type of fruit. Now the pericarp, on the other hand, is made up of three layers. The pericarp is made up of three layers. 
This is a coconut fruit that has been opened up. It's made up of three layers. We have the first layer, which is the one we see when we are looking at the fruit, the green part, is called the epicap, the outer layer. We have a middle mesocap, which is this fibrous part of the coconut. It's called the mesocap. And then we have an inner endocap. It's very, very hard. Now, when you go to the market to buy coconut, the one available in the market is mostly the endocap along with the seed, which is a hard part that you need to use a hard object to break, like hammer. So that is the endocap. It's very hard of the coconut. And that endocap encloses the seed or endosperm, which is the part of the coconut that we usually eat or make use of. Make use of. So these three layers, the outer epicap, which is the green part of the coconut, the middle mesocap, which is the fibrous part, and the hard endocap, which we need to use a hard object to break, are the three layers that make up the pericap. Remember, the outer epicap, the middle mesocap, and the inner endocap make up the pericap, the three layers that make up the pericap. Now, within the pericap, we have the seed. Now, the seed also has something that covers it. We call it the seed coat or tester. I'm sure you know what a tester is. Yes, you know. When you are preparing moi moi from beans, you wash the beans to remove a part and discard so that you can grind the beans and make moi moi from it. That part of bean seed that you throw away is actually the seed coat or tester of the bean seed. So every seed in the world has that kind of covering called the tester that covers the entire seed. So that is the structure of a typical fruit. Now this structure is not like this in all fruit. Like I said, this is that of coconut. If you cut mango across, this is what you see. We have the green part of mango, which is the epicap, the orange part, which is the part we eat, which is the mesocap, and then a very hard layer, very tough, which is the endocap, which of course is the part of mango you throw away when you are eating the mango because it's too hard, and that encloses the seed of the mango. Now, if you consider other fruit also, there is also variation, like in the, in the tomato fruit. Discover that the pericarp is not always the same. We don't have three distinct layers of the pericarp in all fruit. In the case of the tomato fruit, watermelon, guava, pear, you discover that the mesocarp merges with the endocarp. You cannot see three distinct layers as is obtainable in the mango fruit. You discover that the mesocarp merges with the endocarp to form a, a, a soft mass where the seeds are distributed that you can find in tomato and other fruits. So the layers of the pericarp vary depending on the fruit. In some fruits, they are so distinct that you can differentiate them from each other like in the mango fruit. In other fruits, some of the layers mesh with each other. In some fruit, some layers form a chamber, like in orange, tangerine, and lime fruit. So they vary. Another thing is that food is stored, is also stored in this pericarp. Some fruit store fat and oil, mineral salt, water, like we have in watermelon, like this tomato filled with water, and carbohydrate. So a lot of nutrients are stored in the pericarp. So that is what you should know about the structure of the fruit. That takes us to the classes of fruit. All the fruits in the whole world can be grouped into two types. All the fruits in the whole world can be grouped into two types. The first type are called the true fruit, and the second group is called the false fruit. Remember, all the fruits in the world can be grouped into two types. The first type, they are called the true fruit, and the second group, they are called the false fruit. What is a true fruit? A true fruit is a fruit that develops solely from the ovary. If the fruit develops only from the ovary of the flower, remember our diagram, only from the, the ovary, no other part of the flower is added to it, that kind of fruit is a true fruit, like the mango fruit, like the tomato fruit, like the coconut fruit. They come solely from the fertilization of the ovary. Every other part of the flower will wilt away and die off, but the ovary will grow to form these fruits. So these fruits are called true fruits. 
Now, there are fruits that may not, may after developing from the ovary, the other some part of the flower also form the fruit along with the ovary. These are called false fruits. Now, take note of what I say. Apart from the fact that it is the ovary that forms this fruit, other part of the flower are also part of the fruit as the fruit is being formed. These kind of fruit are called false fruit. A very good example is the apple. I know we are very familiar with the apple fruit. Now the truth is that the edible part of the apple fruit, which we are familiar with, this fleshy part that we eat, is actually not from the ovary. It's from the receptacle down here. So when the fruit, the apple fruit is being formed, the nutrients are added, rather added to the receptacle or the thalamus instead of the ovary. And so this fleshy part of the apple that we eat is actually the receptacle. The real apple is just the core, the center. That's where you find the real apple fruit. But the fleshy part is actually part of the receptacle. So that makes apple a false fruit. Another good example of a false fruit is the pineapple. If the pineapple developed from spikes, a kind of flower, it looks like flower with spikes, over 200 of them, depending on the size of the pineapple. So as the pineapple is being formed from the ovary, these spikes along with the ovary grow and form the pineapple fruit. If you look at a typical pineapple fruit like the one I have here, each of the, the hexagonal structure on the body of the pineapple represents a spike, as in a flower. So that makes the pineapple to be a false fruit because it, it, it did not develop solely from the ovary. Other parts of the flower were added to form this fruit. So that makes the pineapple a false fruit. There are other examples of false fruit. I may not, I was not able to lay hands on some of them. A very common one, the cashew fruit. I know a lot of you have seen the cashew fruit before. But assuming you have not seen it before, I want to draw a representation of the cashew fruit to really make us to understand how false fruit are formed. Now, this is a typical cashew fruit, and down here, we we'll have the cashew nut. Now, this is the edible part of the fruit. The fleshy part of the cashew is the one on top. That's the one that is yellowish when it is ripe and we eat and enjoy it. That is where the nutrients are formed. That is not from the ovary. This part of the cashew fruit originated from the thalamus not the ovary of the flower. And so the real cashew fruit is the nut. The real fruit, the cashew fruit, is actually the nut. The nut consists of a very hard pericarp that covers the seed, from where we now get the cashew nut that is commonly sold and we buy and eat. So the whole of this, which is fleshy and edible, which we enjoy, is the thalamus. So that makes cashew to be a false fruit because the part of the flower that did not have any business with fertilization was added to form the fruit. So these are common examples of false fruit that we see around us. Now for a very good examination tip, because if the, the, the questions on fruit are very common, especially with practical biology in YEG, even if you're writing Cambridge, they are very common. When you are drawing the cross section of a fruit like this, or that of maybe tomato, or any fruit at all like this mango. Please remember that when you're drawing the cross section of a fruit, you show the cut lines with a double line. You either be told to draw longitudinally, that is from head, from the head to the tail of the fruit, or across, that is transverse section. Cut it across like the way I cut this tomato across. Either way, if you are drawing mango, for example, and it is cut across, you have been told to cut it, please remember that every layer of the three layers of the apricot must be shown with a double line until you get to the seed. You must show every layer with a double line. That is a very good examination tip to show that you have cut the mango or the tomato, or any other fruit given to you during the exam, you must show each layer with a double line. That shows the examiner that the fruit was cut across. 
If it's a single line, that means you didn't cut the fruit. So to show the examiner that you cut the fruit across or from head to tail, you must show each layer of the three layers of the pericarp with a double line. Please don't forget that is a very important examination tip. Remember I told you there are two, all the fruits in the world can be grouped into two types. That is true fruit and false fruit. Each of these two types of fruits have other classes. For instance, the first class are simple fruits. A simple fruit is a fruit that develops only from one flower. A simple fruit is a fruit that develops only from one flower, like the coconut fruit, like the mango fruit. They develop only from a single flower. That is a simple fruit. A complex fruit or composite fruit is a fruit that develops from an inflorescence. An inflorescence. If you look at this, my flower model, this flower stalk has up to seven flowers. When a, a flower, when a fruit develops from the entire flowers on the stalk, which is an inflorescence, that kind of fruit is called a composite fruit. A very good example of a composite fruit is the pineapple fruit. A very good example of a composite or multiple fruit is a pineapple. Now, like I said initially, if you count the diagonals on the pineapple, they, they, it can be lower than 200. That is the number of flowers that form this pineapple, 200 flowers. So because this fruit was formed from this many flowers, which were on one stalk, that is an entire inflorescence, it formed a composite or multiple, multiple fruit, a very good example being the pineapple. Another type of flower is an aggregate fruit. Another type of fruit is an aggregate fruit. When a fruit is formed from one flower, a single flower like this, that has many ovaries. Remember the diagram I drew. When a, flower, when a fruit is formed from a single flower with many ovaries, a single flower with many ovaries, that kind of fruit is called an aggregate fruit. Let's take that again. When a fruit is formed from a single flower with many ovaries, that kind of flower, that kind of fruit is referred to as an aggregate fruit. A very good example of an aggregate fruit is a strawberry. We also have local examples like cola. I hope you have heard of cola nuts. The cola nut is a seed that comes from the cola tree. And the cola tree bears the cola fruit. And the fruit comes in a stalk. Many fruitlets attached to one stalk. So that makes it an aggregate fruit. Because it's attached to one stalk, it shows that it was one flower that had many ovaries that formed the fruit. So those that is an example of an aggregate fruit. We also have fruit that are fleshy. Now, the fruits like tomato and mango, they are called fleshy fruits. The pericarp of these fruits are thick, succulent, and most times edible. The pericarp of fleshy fruits are thick, succulent, soft, and most times edible. That means you can eat it. It's not poisonous. Also, they have, there is a lot of nutrient stored in the pericarp of uh, fl fleshy fruit. We have minerals, vitamins, a lot of water, a lot of fat and oil, depending on the type of fruit. So these kind of fruits are called fleshy fruit. We also have fruits that are dry. At maturity, the whole pericarp of this fruit become very dry. The apicarp the mesocarp and the endocarp become very dry at maturity so that you cannot really separate them from each other. That kind of fruit is called dry fruit. Can you think of a fruit like that? Yes, we have the cashew, the one I just drew on the board, the cashew nut. I told you that the nut part of the cashew is, a, is the real fruit. And that part of the fruit is always dry. That means you have to break through it before you get to the cashew seed. That is a dry fruit, we call it nut. We have other fruits like the okra. When the okra fruit is matured, those of you that have seen the dry, matured okra, you discover that it's very dry. Other dry fruits are like desmodium. Do you know desmodium? I think you do. When you play in a field, like in the school field, you see some flat objects 
that will attach themselves to your trouser or your skirt or your socks. They are very flat and you need to pull them out of your clothing. That is the smodium. Do you, we have another one called the tridax. Do you know tridax? I think you do. When you're playing in the field, there are some pin-like structures that also get attached to your stockings or your trouser or your dresses. And you need to pull them out the way you pull the flat the smodium. Those ones are called the tridax. If you look at all these fruit, they are very dry. At maturity, they look very dry. We call them dry fruit. We also have another class of fruit called dehiscence fruit. Dehiscent fruit. To dehisce means to break, to open. There are some fruits that when they are dry and matured, they split open. And when they do, they scatter their seeds everywhere. Can you think of a fruit like that? Yes, the okra fruit is like that. When okra is matured, you can see some lines on the dried, or matured okra that when it is very dry, under the heat of the sun, these lines will break and release the seed of the okra and they will fall on the ground. Can you think of any fruit like that? They bring seed, they bring fruit. The beans that we eat, or cowpea, when it is dry, it opens up and releases the seed. Another common one, which I'm very sure your teachers are using to teach you, those of you that are in SS3, or used to teach you when you go to SS2 and 3, is called, the sm is called Pride of Barbados. Pride of Barbados. It looks like a bean pod. At maturity, it is very, very dry. And when it is dry like that, under the heat of the sun, it will split open to the highs and scatter the seed everywhere. Those are dry fruit that can break open at maturity. Then the another group of dry fruits are indehiscent fruits. Indehiscent fruits. These ones, when they are dry, they can't split open and release their seed. What happens is that their seed will fall to the ground, stay on the ground. As the rain falls on the seed, it will become soft, decay, and release the seed. They don't have the ability to split open and scatter their seed. These type of fruits are called indehiscent fruit. Can you think of an example? Good. We have the desmodium, we just, I just described. We have the tridax, it's dry, but it cannot split open. We also have, of course, the knot of the cashew. It's dry, but it cannot split open. So this group of fruits are called indehiscent fruit. So we have two types of fruit, true fruit or false fruit. The true fruit can either be simple, aggregate, composite, fleshy, or dry. While the false fruit can either be simple, multiple, aggregate, fleshy, or dry. So we have these two groups that the whole fruit in the universe can be grouped into, the two types, false fruit or dry fruit. And then we have these classes that fall under these two big types, that is false or fleshy. So that means that a, a fruit can belong to two types or two groups. For instance, the mango is a true fruit. It is also a simple fruit. At the same time, it is also a fleshy fruit. The same thing goes for the, the, for the tomato. It is a true fruit. It is a simple fruit and is also a fleshy fruit. Now, on, on the other hand, the pineapple is a false fruit and is also a fleshy fruit. Fleshy because we do consume pineapple and we can see that, we can see that it is very fleshy. At the same time, it is a multiple or composite fruit. So one fruit can belong to many of these classes, as we can see. So for instance, the cashew is a false fruit, is a false fruit, and is also a dry fruit. So these are the many groups that come under these two main types, true fruits and false fruits. Now, that was what we have today. Today, we have been able to look at the definition of a typical fruit. We also considered the structure of a fruit, and we're able to also discuss the two types of fruit that we have in the world. That is, all the fruits in the world can be grouped into two types. And I've also given you a very important tip on drawing of fruit, because it's a very common feature in every practical examination.
be it WAEC or NECO or any exam, is a very common feature. And now for your assignments, I want you to consider common fruit that you know. Some of them you have, they are around you in the house, they may be in the fridge or anywhere around you. Maybe you have it in the compound you're living. Consider this fruit and place them into groups based on their structure. What I mean by structure is how the fruit look when you are looking at them physically, how they appear. Place this common fruit that you know and you are familiar with into groups based on how they look when you are looking at them, their structure. Because that is what we'll be considering in the next class. Remember that like flowering plants, we are also to bear fruit. God expects us to bear fruit. These fruits are called the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Like joy, peace, love, kindness, gentleness, self-control. They are very important fruit that we must bear as believers. Because the presence of this fruit is an, in our life is an evidence that we are becoming more like Jesus Christ. So until we meet next time, stay safe. Bye-bye.